So thank you everyone for joining us today for our session um, on learning pathways for women in STEM and specifically talking about graduate school experiences. My name is Patrice Prusco. I'm the Associate Director Learning Design at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And on behalf of the Women in STEM Co Cooperative, welcome. Uh, the Women in STEM Cooperative consists of a group of volunteers who are dedicated to advancing women in STEM in our respective communities at the University at Buffalo. This series is an attempt to address some of the systemic challenges and opportunities with improving student STEM success. Before we invite today's distinguished panel to get started, we would just like to take a moment to welcome you, our guests, over 140 of your colleagues representing 56 different institutions of higher education, eight other organizations from four countries, one territory, and 25 states have registered for this series. Um, if you're joining us today, please take a moment to say hello in the chat room. Let us know where you're joining from and any specific questions or wonderings that you might have that you're interested in hearing more about. Um, and I also would like to thank uh, Becky Burke and Letitia Thomas for um, all their help and co-coordinating um, all of these sessions and just supporting and organizing and making this happen. So today we have three guests. We have Wei Yu Shen, who is mentoring program co-chair and a PhD student in applied physics at Harvard. Um, we then have Nicole Black, who is currently pursuing a PhD in bioengineering at the John Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences and is a National Science Foundation graduate research fellow. And Nicole is going to be sharing some of her experiences with us today around the multiple STEM outreach opportunities she's been involved in, um, as well as her time working as an intern at a startup and her um, current research around 3D printing. Um, and then we have Jason Hustis, who is the Director of Student Development and Training Evaluation, a lecturer in biology, chemistry, and molecular pharmacology at the Harvard Medical School. Um, and he's going to talk to us about a website he developed that consists of information that is um, important for students in supporting their career development and pathways. And he's um, going to tell us about this exciting project that kind of keeps all of that information in one easy place for them to find and be accessible. And um, with that, um, we're going to start with Wei Yu, and she's going to share with, with us just some of the supports and experiences she's had on her pathway into you know, a STEM major and you know, supports that she found really critical to her success and what she is doing to make sure that um, other women have similar supports. Hi everyone, I'm Wei Lu. I'm a fourth year PhD student um, in applied physics at Harvard at the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. I did my undergraduate um, degree at RPI, Rensselaer Polytechnic, um, in New York, um, and I majored in physics there. And yeah, so I, I can quickly speak about my background in that um, I come from a, like, a privileged situation that my father is a physics professor. So until like say, you know, like around college time, I never thought I couldn't do science because I was a woman or if it was just not normal because I, I saw, you know, female scientists because of my dad. And he also never said I couldn't do anything. And he always encouraged me to do it. But then, you know, college happens and then you no longer have that kind of 50-50 ratio in science classes in high school. And oftentimes I would be the only girl in a study group or in a library or in a class most of the time in a class and it became like a very conscious thing for me that like oh if I say something wrong it makes women in science look bad or if they some say something kind of you know passive aggressive or aggressive aggressive and if I don't speak up it'll be sort of like a missed opportunity for me to you know put things right but then if I do it'd be like aggression back. And I'm like, okay, I'm not even going to like engage. And I think um, I benefited in that I had really good mentors and research. Um, I did like research opportunities um, actually at Harvard. So I was an RU student um, through the NSF at Harvard. 
And I was able to have really great female mentors who not only talk to me about research and how I want to be as a scientist, but also navigating like how to be the only female in the room and how to sort of navigate all of that, not just in terms of like how I behave with other people, but also like being like what you're experiencing is not abnormal, but it's not right. And it felt like validating that I wasn't the only person who felt really shitty about certain things. Um, and then I went to, I came to Harvard and I think Harvard has like a fantastic women in science community. Um, and during the open house, there was even like a special event where it was just, you know, female scientists, like faculty, postdocs and graduate students and um, incoming students. and it just felt really nice to just hear that students had a positive experience. And if there was a negative experience, they felt like they had like the system built in place to talk about it. And obviously that's not necessarily true for every graduate students, but I felt like, okay, like this is the right environment for me. And I came and I just felt like it was such a good group of people that I wanted to work with. And I felt, well, like, you know, if I got really good female mentors then maybe I can also, do that for other people and especially as you go later on into your career you see that there's like less and less women as you go further down like even if like the department seems to have a lot relatively high number of female students compared to like other programs you look at the postdocs and they're still very heavily female a uh, man male and then like the faculty is like very rarely do you see a female faculty. So I, I felt like um, participating in uh, HGYs, which is um, the Harvard Graduate Women um, in Science for graduate students, it's not only just like programs to help people come together, but it's also, um, there's like a mentorship layer to it as well, where we pair um, graduate students with a woman who might be further down in their career, whether it's a postdoc, a professor, or even people outside of academia, because I mean, I never technically worked outside of academia, so I, I wouldn't necessarily know. And there's tons of people who also uh, feel the same way. And then through that, I also wanted to kind of like give back. And especially if I'm going to be, if I, since I am working with undergraduate students in a lab, I wanted to help female undergraduate students outside of the lab to sort of give them an out, outside perspective because maybe they didn't get lucky in having a really good mentor in lab but can benefit from ha from having a mentor who's not just like there to be like oh you should sign up for this internship or that internship but be like oh like the, the, what they said to you is not okay or oh like you know this is why I experienced in the past and this is why I did so it's sort of like a nice situation where I also, I benefit from having a mentor, but I also can sort of like pass down what I've experienced through having a mentee. So yeah, so that's like my experience so far. Um, like I'm very lucky that my lab is 50-50 male, female, I think right now. Yeah, actually we have more women than men right now in our lab, which is like super surprising, but um, I think it comes to like having an advisor who is a man but cares a lot about um, like diversity and talking about diversity and talking like once we were talking about the the academic lineage of like uh, like Bloombergen and all of these like um, incredible electrodynamic people and he was like oh, I mean you know these are all white men from prestigious institutions and Thankfully, now it's more diverse, but we can't look at them and be like, they're amazing. We have to look at them and be like, yeah, they're amazing, but they also had like extraordinary privilege that other people didn't have then. So having people around me who are actively having those conversations have benefited me. So I want to have those like conversations with other people as well. So yeah, that's my experience. Um, so yeah. I guess I'll pass the baton on to uh, Nicole, unless people have questions or if we're having questions at the end. 
I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, I think we'll go through all the speakers and then have some Q&A at the end, but definitely I'll be monitoring the chat box. So if anyone has any questions, I'll be checking the chat and can bring those to the speakers as well. Um, so yes, now we'll turn it over to Nicole. All right, thank you, Patrice. And thanks, Weilu, for uh, the great lead-in discussion, um, particularly about, around mentoring. Um, I actually met Weilu because we were both uh, coordinators together for the HGY's mentoring program. And that was a really great experience. And that actually um, led the way into another mentoring program that I now coordinate at Harvard um, called the WISTEM or Women in STEM program. Um, before I talk about these mentoring programs and sort of what I've learned by working in these and in other sort of mentorship roles, um, I'll give you a bit of my background. So um, I'm originally from Michigan. Um, I went to Boston University for undergrad in biomedical engineering. Um, I sort of always knew, you know, I wanted to do something in the medical fields. You know, being from Michigan, automatically you assume you're going to go into the auto industry if you're an engineer which didn't unfortunately interest me all that much. Um, thought for a long time that I might go to medical school and then realized I didn't want to, you know, deal with all the gross things involved in medical school, which is funny because now I do way grosser things. <laughs> um, so I went to BU and um, it was a great experience. Um, but then, you know, I started learning more. I, I went into it actually wanting to do um, uh, synthetic biology. So, uh, genetic engineering, um, and then realized I kind of more liked engineering things that I could see and I could hold, and um, devices, particularly uh, implantables and new materials for implantables. And so I did several research experiences as an undergraduate, um, one at Vanderbilt, another at Columbia, and then I also studied abroad at University of Sydney and worked in a lab there for a little bit. Um, Built up a lot of great research experience, um, but I always knew that, you know, my heart was not really in academia or teaching. I sort of wanted to be on the translational side of things in, in the medical device industry. And so senior year, um, you know, I was looking into a variety of jobs in the medical device industry and realized very quickly that the roles that I was interested in all required uh, some sort of graduate degree and most of them a PhD. Um, and I don't think this is something that many people necessarily realize when they're an undergraduate that graduate school is not just for people that, you know, want to become a professor and, and go into academia and go down that very traditional um, route. Uh, you know, the skills that you learn in a PhD around um, collaboration, uh, knowing how to solve a problem and find the resources to solve a problem is really well strengthened by doing a PhD, particularly in a city like Boston. Um, for example, my current uh, project now, we're 3D printing new materials for eardrum graphs. And so this is, there's a lot of diverse problems involved in this, you know, everything from manufacturing hurdles um, to testing, uh, to, you know, the animal studies that we run, um, thinking about, you know, the ear in different ways. Uh, requires a very diverse audience. And so knowing how to interact with everyone from surgeons um, to engineers to people that are very pure scientists um, is, is very useful in, in, you know, you eventually will, will utilize these skills later on. So um, I made this realization um, and ended up obviously going to graduate school. Um, the summer in between undergraduate and graduate school, I did intern for a small startup company um, that was based in Medford. Um, and this is, uh, it's actually sponsored by a program that, that uh, you should all look into if you're either um, from Massachusetts originally or you're going to a Massachusetts school. It's called the Massachusetts Life Science Center. And so they will actually pay startup companies to pay you so the startup company doesn't have to use their very limited funding. And so um, I was in this role for um, a few months uh, before I started graduate school. Really interesting experience because um, myself and the other intern were like the only ones there under the age of 40 uh, in this company. Um, and so being a, a young female in STEM, particularly when everyone above you is, is an older male for the most part is, is an interesting experience for sure. Um, you know, I do feel like our contributions were valued um, significantly, uh, mostly because we were doing all of the actual lab work. But <laughs> um, I, it's it was a it's a level of confidence that I developed. Um, you know, being able to find 
you know, report my findings to, you know, a CEO who's maybe, um, you know, that has a very important title and role and uh, things like that. So I think that was a very valuable experience. And then when I started graduate school, so I joined a lab that does 3D printing for, you know, a variety of things. Um, and I realized I really wanted to continue in this translational space, which there wasn't quite a project in yet in our lab. Um, met some surgeons at Mass Ioneer, and that's how this all started, and I've been working on it since then. Um, so, you know, along this process, I've also learned a lot about inventorship. Um, I don't think I really realized what it meant to be an inventor before. I remember as a little kid, I would always, you know, people would say, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up? It's always either doctor or inventor. Well, soon, hopefully I'll be both, not a medical doctor, but um, you don't, you know, an interesting thing about invention is people think patents, um, which is true, and a, but a patent is really just a way to protect your invention, and it's a legal thing, um, but you can be an inventor without having a patent, and you can um, come up with new ideas and um, implement them without, you know, uh, getting this legal process involved. Um, you know, Harvard luckily has a very great Office of Technology Development. And so when we were developing some of these new technologies, uh, they were very useful in um, affiliating us with different um, patent lawyers and things like that for this process. Uh, you know, one interesting, you know, as a woman in STEM, sometimes I feel like you do get questioned more and you do have to prove yourself more, especially when it comes to things like patenting. Um, even though I had already been an inventor on, you know, several patents, um, there was one in particular, you know, where I remember the, the PI was really questioning my inventorship on this. She didn't question any of the males, uh, that were co-inventors at all, just me. And so I had to basically dig through, you know, tons, thousands of emails, lab notebooks, demonstrating all the things I had contributed to this invention and prove myself doing this extra work. Um, to show that I was indeed an inventor. And we went through this full inventorship analysis and they proved that, yes, of course, I was an inventor, actually listed as the first inventor on the patent. So just know that um, you it, it's a battle, um, but uh, you have to be your own advocate a lot of times. Don't uh, expect other people to step up for you. It's, of course, wonderful if they do, um, but don't be afraid to let other people know what your accomplishments are and what your contributions have been. I think that's been an important lesson that I've learned. Um, along with the, that inventorship part, um, you know, I think this has been a really valuable experience being in a graduate program with so much flexibility in what I work on. Um, and, you know, particularly in the medical device space, one thing I've, I've slowly realized is that a lot of these big medical device companies that I had sort of you know, romanticized and always wanted to work for really don't do much innovation. A lot of what large medical device companies do is take products that already exist and manufacture them and they're a sales force for the most part. And that was not, you know, obviously what I had wanted to do. Um, so, you know, the best route really for you to get your ideas into the world is for you to do it yourself. And being in Boston, we're very lucky that we're in an ecosystem that highly supports student inventors and ventures and startup companies. And so through some of these uh, endeavors, I've been lucky to um, participate in um, the Harvard iLab, for example, is President Innovation Challenge. Um, Harvard also has a program called Activate, uh, where you can get matched up with a Harvard Business School student and uh, talk to different venture capitalists about your idea and what you, you know, might need to do to bring it forward. So I think this has been a really valuable experience as well. Along with the mentoring um, parts, so I really want to focus on inventorship and mentorship, which are my two favorite words uh, that rhyme. Um, so uh, through you know graduate school, obviously I've tried to make mentorship um, a cornerstone of my experience because of how much I've benefited from mentors in my life. Um, so in addition to participating in the HGYS program, I've been coordinating this uh, Women in STEM program, which matches undergraduates at Harvard College uh, with primarily graduate student mentors. Um, so Waylu is one of those. She's a very great mentor in our program. Um, but also we have some medical students, postdocs, people in industry. And, you know, one thing I've realized through coordinating this program for so many years is, you know, being an effective mentor is, um, it, it's not about, you know, taking the person and making them like a mini version of yourself. Uh, <laughs> that's really not, that's really not, um, 
in their best interest is on your best interest. Um, really, it's helping them find their niche in the world and really what their big impact is going to be and how to get there. And, you know, mentorship can take many forms. Um, it could be anything from just, you know, being an advocate for someone um, to, uh, t you know, sending them resources, links to labs uh, that they might be interested in, reviewing their applications. Um, obviously, if you are a lab research mentor, this looks, this looks different. Um, it's more about teaching skills and uh, concrete, you know, research ideas. But the purpose of the WISDEM program is really more for this general, you know, broad life mentoring aspect. And a lot of people assume when they want to mentor, you know, they want someone who's like a big version of themselves. Like, what, what, what do I want to see myself, you know, in, in X number of years? And, you know, while that might be one good form of mentorship, um, I find things that relationships that look great on paper like these two people are both, you know, in chemistry, they both have these interests, you just might not click in real life. And uh, there are so many things that go into an effective mentoring relationship beyond just what field you're in. And a lot of this is outlook on life, outlook on your priorities, um, particularly as, as women in STEM, um, we can sometimes have different priorities. Um, you know, uh, work-life balance is a big issue. Um, knowing how to navigate some of these gender conversations, um, you know, when you're feeling like someone is not taking you as seriously because you're a woman, things like that. Um, and people have different levels of comfort discussing these topics. And I think that that is also a large component. And so when we're doing the matching for this program, it's, it's a quite extensive application, but we really take everything holistically that people say um, into account and really what they want out of a mentor, not just, hey, she's in chemistry, she's in chemistry, here you go. Um, and I think that that's made a big impact. Um, our program has grown immensely since uh, I first joined. We had about 90 people at the beginning and now we have 270 members at Harvard. Um, and it's, <laughs> it's almost beyond capacity. Uh, so we're trying to get mentoring software next year, for example. Um, but yeah, so uh, if anyone has any more questions about mentorship, um, please let me know um, in the chat box or you, know, you can always feel free. I can put my email address in the box too if anyone wants to chat offline about anything. But yeah, I really think you know, mentorship as a woman in STEM is, is extremely important and you know, really just look beyond the field and look beyond, you know, if this is someone you would necessarily want their career path or not. Um, there's value that you can get from every conversation. Yes. Great, thank you. Um, and, you know, as you were talking about email addresses, um, I was going to add, if anyone is, wants to share their Twitter handle or LinkedIn profile or anything like that, this is a great opportunity to, you know, build your network and connect with some people. Um, and now we will hand it off to you, Jason. All right, awesome, thank you. Um, so I'll start off with a little bit of background about myself as well. So I'm actually originally from Belize. Um, I did high school and started my community college work in Belize and then transferred to, to finish my undergrad in the US. So I um, did undergrad at St. Louis University. Always had a little bit of a sort of broad interest in a lot of things. So I was a biochemistry and a poli-sci major um, and so, um, after that, I did research for a year. So I started doing research um, with a mentor as an undergrad when I was a junior. Um, and then after, grad, after undergrad, ended up taking a summer job doing a research technician position, which I ended up having really good mentors at various stages. So I um, fell in with um, very good mentors there. My undergrad advisor actually was the one who helped me get that position with his wife um, as a technician for her. And actually she was just about leaving from that lab where she'd been a research associate to start her own lab in Michigan. And so they asked me if I'd consider moving to Michigan and helping to set up the lab there. So I did that for a year while I applied to grad school. I was pretty sure that I wanted to do a master's degree and then do something else. Um, and so I applied only for master's programs in the Boston area. Um, I'd come to Boston once before and I loved it. So I applied for programs here, got into a master's program um, and ended up um, going to Tufts to do that degree. Um, while I was there, actually the funding situation changed in the lab where I was at, and I was actually able to stay, had the option of staying on to do a doctoral degree with my advisor at the time. 
So I finished my PhD at Tufts. During the time that I was in grad school, I got very interested in sort of, I call them extracurricular activities, but they were pretty much student leadership positions. Um, and so ended up at one point being um, president of the student government there, um, revitalizing that, um, working with a lot of people to get that as a pretty functioning organization. Learned a lot about administration and realized that there were multiple different things that I could do to have an impact. Um, and I got involved in regional and national organizations. So by the time I finished the PhD, very glad I finished the PhD, had the science training, but I knew I didn't want to go to do a traditional postdoc. Um, I ended up going into what I would consider one of the bins of non-traditional postdocs, especially at that time, when I went to become a curriculum fellow at Harvard Medical School. So this is a position for people who are trained in the life sciences, who want to transition into more education or higher ed admin. Um, I started off working on curriculum for biochemistry and gradually um, started to do more and more stuff at the department level, started to help programs with data collection and pro strategic planning for programs to meet grad student needs, and then ended up ultimately in this position where I'm the director for student development and training evaluation. So in my role, a significant part of it was actually my entire trajectory at Harvard was sort of influenced by my experience coming through graduate school. And I've always been very interested in sort of efficiently connecting myself and other people with resources. And so I actually graduated in 2012. If you're familiar with that year from the life sciences, that was actually a pretty bad year to graduate. Um, with a PhD in life sciences, there was like a lot of people graduating and the market had kind of tightened for positions um, to land into a postdoc. So it was kind of good that I wasn't looking for a science postdoc at the time. Um, but it was a very rough year to graduate. I can explain why later. But um, I kind of reflected a lot on what I learned in graduate school, what I thought would have been helpful for me. And I think that motivated a lot of what I tried to do in my positions as it progressed over time after graduate school. So the, what I'll introduce you to is actually one of the sort of big deliverable products that I released about two years ago. And it actually got informed by the fact that in my job, I get a lot of emails and a lot of chains and networks and everybody's doing really innovative things where they create this resource that they think, oh, this would help my grad students. So I should share this with everybody. And we do that, um, and we do um, share those resources, but one of the problems is sometimes people see those in the email. They might not never, never open that email. If they see it, they might look at it but not register it. And more often than not, even if they did look at it, when you actually need that resource, you're going to forget it. Um, you won't remember to use it right at that time. And so what I was trying to do was cut back on the forwarding of emails and think about how could we be more strategic in all the resources that people have and this also mirrors another discussion, which is about individual development planning for graduate students. So if you've never heard of an IDP, again, that's an individual development plan. For people in the life sciences, it's motivated by the National Institutes of Health that we work with graduate students from the time they come into graduate school to think about where they want to go um, in terms of their career. There's a lot of people who do come to graduate school and want to be faculty members but we know that by the end of graduate school, it's actually about 20% of our life sciences population who go on to that trajectory. So the other 80% of people haven't failed, they haven't lost their way. Uh, other people get interest, they pursue other passions, and part of it is to get people to really assess what they want to do from early stages in graduate school and then think about how to use graduate school to get to that goal. And so we've also instituted these requirements for students to do individual development plans with their mentors. And so that's to, or the principal investigators, the people who had their labs, to say this to your advisor, this is what I want to do, this is where I'm trying to go, how do I do that? And what we've done by creating this site is try to put resources into that equation by saying, we know you're having a conversation, but you don't know all the resources that are out there that could help you at these points. Um, as Waylu pointed out, your faculty advisor might not know all the things that they, um, you might want to know, and so it's good to have people who are from other sectors give you in advice. Um, and so we wanted to take that advice from people who are in other sectors, people who are building all the innovative, innovative programs and put them in one place for students. The other thing about that is that we wanted to do it in an organized way. So what I'll do is actually share a link with you um, for a website, which we launched two years ago. And it was a product that I built with two graduate students who are at Harvard. No, one of them just defended her PhD. Rachel Rudlaff and the other one, Tito Adikari, is still working with me. So I just put the link in the chat box um, for the Career Navigator. Um, and there are multiple pages on the site. In some ways, it's, to, it's um, 
two ser two pronged serving, both for people who are at Harvard. And for now, I'll actually share my screen so that you can also watch it there, but you have the link in case you wanna play with this site on your own. So this is the Navigator site. Um, and I get, as a point out, it's actually built for two purposes. In a way, it was supposed to be to connect or Harvard graduate students with things that they need to know right now, like articles and announcements, um, events. But a lot of the event, a lot of the things that are on the site are actually useful for any graduate student. And so we try to keep that framing with how we organize things on the site. For example, the job postings, if you go there, we actually post um, postdoc positions and jobs that people send to us. And you also know that we've been pretty broad in defining more postdocs now. So taking from our own experiences that there are all these other types of postdocs like science communication, science outreach, and trying to connect students with those. Um, and for now, although typically the events page is a um, limited number of events that are sort of more for the Harvard population, we've had to move everything online, remote offerings of things, and we've opened all those things up to the public. So if you're actually looking for professional development um, opportunities over the summer, those events are open and you can register on the site. Um, and that includes about seven or eight sessions in the summer that are gonna focus on prepping you for the academic job market. We know that next year is gonna be a challenging year um, for that, but we still wanna give people the opportunity to take advantage of the time you might have right now to actually work on your portfolio materials. And so we do things like bring in faculty to teach you how to do research statements, teaching statements, diversity statements, faculty, um, sorry, CVs, cover letters, how to read job postings and know what kind of candidate they're looking for. Um, because that stuff you can still get momentum on right now. And so that will be happening in July and the dates will be on this site. But the part that's actually relevant here is what we're turning into now a guide for students and faculty, which is in the resources bin. So if you hover over that resources page, you'll notice it drops down into seven bins. And we kind of organize this in terms of, think about it from top to bottom as what we want to tell trainees you should be thinking about in an order as you go into graduate school and as you're getting ready to leave. And it's also built to try to be useful for both masters and doctoral students. So one of the first things that was sort of the most recent addition to the site, we actually used to have a different seventh bin that got removed and replaced by wellness and safety. Well, it was always there, but it was part of charting your course. And we actually thought the number of resources we're seeing for wellness and safety are growing. And actually, we wanted to make it clear one of our messages, which is that part of your success as a person, as a professional, will be dependent on your ability to take care of yourself. Um, and so actually ingraining that very early into graduate training for students, that that's actually a legitimate thing to think about. And it's not about pushing yourself to the end um, and killing yourself in the process of getting the degree. And so actually thinking about things like mindfulness and wellness. So the resources page have wellness and safety. Then there's a section called charting your course, then finding and securing funding, academic and how to develop academic and professional skills, how to develop interpersonal skills, which is actually one of those areas that are one of the hardest things to teach and the most limited um, of resources exist. And then um, the career exploration and the job search. And just as an FYI, uh, because I'm viewing the website right now, I'm not looking at the chat box. So if somebody else is paying attention to it and sees any questions that I should be answering, please interject because I have the screen blown up right now. Okay, Just I'm that. keeping an eye on it. All right, cool. Thank you. Um, all right. So I'm going to walk you through really quickly what we mean by these seven things. And what, again, I want you to think back about individual development planning and what we're trying to convey with students. We ask students to talk to their advisors, have a yearly discussion about their individual development plan, chart a course for where they're wanting to go, and I've actually then essentially mandate a mentor-mentee discussion about that. Typically, they have to fill out a form that says, this is what the students told me they're trying to do, this is the advice I gave, and people have done write-ups on how to do effective versions of that, um, and I wanna, and I'll be able to share that with you as well. I'm one of those papers about how to actually have that type of discussion. But um, just going through this really quick, start with wellness and safety, it actually breaks down right now only into three bins. There are actually seven, and we're still migrating resources onto the site. But we try to remind people that there's a place to think about your identity and culture and how you fit into your new environment when you get there. Um, thinking about your mental well-being and resilience during graduate school, and then financial well-being and planning are some of the three ones that we already have. But we already know that we need to add stuff for things like personal and public safety, lab safety. Um, what's the other one? Uh, physical well-being and spiritual well-being. 
um, as things that students have told us that they're looking to connect with and that we're adding to the site. Um, on their charting your course, we try to connect students. And again, these things integrate everything that's at Harvard, but also things that are not at Harvard. And so we look to resources from the University of Washington, Washington University, Stanford, um, multiple institutions, University of Illinois, where we found really good resources that people might want, and you can get them from the site. Um, and so what we connect students with, again, for example, is academic support and advising, individual development plans. This one is a little bit Harvard specific because it's about finding concentrations, consortia and certificates at Harvard, student services and affairs, dissertation defenses, data and outcomes, which is really important for getting students to see that early on and see that it's okay to have other aspirations. And we actually really work a lot with our faculty to try and change the stigma that every student wants to be a faculty member uh, and try to tell them, look at the data. And it's not just that we broke the students and they ended up in these other paths. You can actually ask students when they come to grad school and they know that before they come here, that that's not the path they wanna go on, right? And so being receptive to that message and teaching them how to advise students. Um, on their fund, funding and secure, finding and securing funding, we have a space for scholarships. So that's very of interest to our master's students. Um, resources for grant writing, um, how to find graduate fellowships, how to find postdoctoral fellowships, information for international trainees who often have a bit more restrictions for US sources of funding, um, and then things for current and future faculty. Under academic and professional skills, we connect people with things for research skills, quant and computational skills, written communication, oral communication, teaching and business and financial skills. Um, under interpersonal skills, not all the content is there yet, but we have diversity, inclusion, and avoiding bias, teamwork and collaboration, mentoring, conflict resolution, and some of the other ones that we know, for example, we don't yet have the content on there for is like giving and receiving feedback, uh, management and leadership um, also need to be added to the site. On the career exploration, we connect you with self tools for self-assessment self and values. I think one of the things that goes unnoticed a lot for students who are looking for career advice is that they haven't yet sorted out what it is that they want for themselves um, and realizing that that should be part of that discussion of what you're thinking about when you're narr narrowing down what your options are after grad school. We also give you resources for range of options, experiential learning, student organization, specific careers, and networking. Um, and then finally, under the job search, there is resources for preparing application materials, searches and applications, salaries and negotiation, and global mobility. So the program we, uh, programming we offer over the course of the year that I do now really fits with these themes. Um, it's kind of sad because we had a really good one coming up about global mobility um, at the end of March. Obviously, um, that was not the time to talk about global mobility, so we had to reschedule that one for next year. Um, but we kind of mirror this in the programming. Um, before I turn it over just to make sure we have time for questions, I'll just give you an example of two things that are on the site that are resources, by what I mean are, are useful for you regardless of where you are. So one of the things we've heard from students is that right now they feel like they have time because they're not in the lab. And while a lot of people are not necessarily forcing themselves to think about being productive, people want to know what are some of the things that I could do if I have this time away from the lab to develop myself professionally. And we got a call from faculty to think about whether there are online courses that people could take um, right now that would help them build skills. And so we added this about, actually only about five days ago, where we tried to do, a, also if you go under academic support and advising, and you'll notice there's a thing called compiled list of online science skills building and professional development courses for STEM students. It's a Google Docs repository that we continue to add to but we have three tabs on it. And if you're looking for any online courses that are free and self-paced, that will help you learn some stuff about science or research, that includes things from biochemistry, immunology, epidemiology. There's also stuff on quant computational skills, so how to learn programming, how to learn biostats, that type of stuff. Again, these are all free courses online. Um, and then there's a section for career and professional development, where we have some of the resources echoed again from the site. But we also have classes that people have developed for everything from soft skills, research skills, business principles, entrepreneurship, um, science communication. So, and the one other resource I'll show you before I turn it back over to Q&A is, again, if you go on the resources page and you skip down to career exploration, 
and go under experiential learning. When I say experiential learning, that typically means things like internships. A lot of people are questioning right now the ability to do internships when you can't be somewhere physically. And so one of the resources I think is really cool and I've been trying to promote with students is something called the Intersect Job Simulation Library. So in this, instead of doing an internship, you could do a four to eight hour experience, actually kind of getting a sense of multiple different jobs. And so if you actually go to their site, um, you'll see that it has multiple different job sims. So advocacy, um, market analysis, um, business related clinical trials, uh, intellectual property. And if you click on one of those, I don't want to spend too much time talking about it, but effectively it will introduce you to the field, tell you the type of tasks that you would do in that type of job, walk you through what some your boss might ask you to do, show you what the deliverable should look like if you did it well. And then if you don't know how to do this stuff, it directs you to places where you can learn the skills online to help you do that in the future. So you can really kind of get a sense of what is it that somebody who does IP and has to do our freedom of an um, operation analysis, what are they actually doing? Freedom to operate analysis. So I'll stop for now, but happy to answer any questions moving forward. Great. Thank you, Jason. That's a, a great, uh, great set of resources. I especially love the list of free online classes. Um, so um, Becky had a question around um, whether or not you've seen any evidence of your interpersonal area covering bias having results. You know, have you done any studies or research around impact of that or anything else on your, you know, your site? Ah, good question. So, for, so far, we built the site and we have the resources there, right? So one of the things that I can do is actually check which things end up getting hits, which things people are looking at. Mm -hmm. um, that's the extent of what I can do right now. But that was the first step was to actually make this website and have it be a thing so that we could organize stuff for it. But the next thing is having a website and getting people to actually use it is a separate task, right? And so we've been rolling out two different things to get that going. The first of which is to have a digest. So actually, I'm happy to add people to the digest for a site, um, which is not written for Harvard. It actually is written for the public. Um, where we highlight in the news, articles, and uh, um, things that focus on life sciences, graduate students, um, but also news about um, new resources that we've added to the site. We feature that every week, I'm sorry, every two weeks. And so we kind of drive people back to the site to let them know these things have been added. And then the second thing is we've built the programming for the year now, starting this year and really for next year, so that there's one event for each of the little sub bins, at least one event, right? And so I think to test what you're asking, what I'd want to do is make sure that they come to the event on bias or implicit bias or anything that is in the works for next year, and then do something like a pre-post or follow-up and or follow-up to see what the impact of the events are. But for right now, it's really more at the analytics end. I can tell what people are looking at the most on the site. And obviously, job postings is the page that if you do do any advertising, that's what people look at the most. Okay. And this is a question possibly um, for all three of you that I always um, like to ask at these sessions. If I'm somebody watching and I'm thinking that this seems like, you know, either like the mentor program or the website, something that I would like to start at my own institution, if you could talk to how do you get started? What kind of resources do you need? How might you get buy-in? You know, who the stakeholders are and that kind of thing. So I don't know if, you know, Nicole, you want to start and then um, we can go from there. Yeah, sure. Um, I was pretty lucky with the WISDOM program in that it already existed when I joined. So I took over that role. However, there have been other endeavors um, at Harvard uh, that I've, I've led around uh, diversity, inclusion, belonging, particularly in the School of Engineering Applied Sciences. Um, we have a new uh, diversity, inclusion, belonging committee. And so there's been several initiatives that, you know, I've spearheaded along with some others around it. Um, you know, really uh, know that a lot of these institutions have funding for these types of things. Um, in particular, Harvard has a new grant mechanism, uh, the Cliff Grants Culture Lab Innovation Fund, uh, where you can apply for uh, funding for some of these things around diversity, inclusion, belonging. This was specifically targeted for increasing the role of technology in these programs. Um, also, like a lot of student organizations um, maybe have their own mentoring programs, but some of them don't. And so if 
you, uh, for example, are really interested in starting up a mentoring program, for example, um, women in chemistry or something, oftentimes reaching out to these organizations that already have access to a large listserv, have some flexible funding from the university for different events can be um, a good way to move forward. And I would really just encourage you to talk to as many people as possible who run similar programs and figuring out, you know, best practices around, you know, how should I recruit members? How should I do matching? How many events should I hold a year? Um, because a lot of people have already, you know, been there in similar situations and um, it can, you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can learn from their experiences and see what might work well for it. So, um, and really, you know, just have confidence when you're going about this process and know that, you know, you can make change and it's actually quite easy. I found to, you know, recruit people into different programs. Um, most people want to help actually it, weirdly in like most of these mentoring programs I'm in, it's sometimes easier to recruit mentors than mentees because everyone <laughs> wants to help. Um, and so, yeah, don't be shy about reaching out to others, I think is, is my major takeaway and take advantage of resources that already exist at the institution to push it forward. Great, thank you. I don't know if um, Wei Yu, you have anything to add or Jason? Yeah, I completely agree with Nicole. And I guess another thing to add to it is just to like, I know this sounds a little bit like more on the pragmatic side, but like find allies, I guess, within the department. Like, you know, these professors usually, you know, they, they're more than willing to support you with it. And a lot of the undergraduate um, organizations, I, I think actually need um, faculty sponsors. And if you find a right faculty member who will speak up for you and also like, uh, you know, I know this sounds cold, but it, it also helps them with their grant writing to be like, oh, I support diversity in sciences um, to include in their like, federal proposals, which I know that sounds like kind of like fake, but they're more than happy usually to like talk to you about it and provide some kind of resources or even just like their name. Um, so yeah, like I wouldn't think of it as like, I need their help. It's more like I'm bringing everybody into the conversation and everybody should want to participate kind of uh, like philosophy. Yeah. All right. Oh, sorry. The only two things I, would, I think I could add to that is to say, um, I have two perspectives on that. I taught the students a lot about connecting with mentors. And the only thing I remind people of is that you don't have one mentor. Um, ultimately, you're looking for multiple different people who can help you with different things. And it's also that it's a reciprocal thing, that, not be, that it's not just you are getting. Um, mentors learn a lot by actually working with you. And so that's part of the benefit for them. So it's not just like you're taking up their time. So you should feel willing to look for those people. And then I've also seen in terms of resources, one of the things that started within the last year is that we've been seeing a growing number of peer mentoring programs um, develop where the programs are trying to support having senior students work with junior students. And we find that the senior students are overwhelmingly willing to do that. Um, and junior students are actually the ones that might not yet feel comfortable feeling that they need to have a mentor. Um, but we definitely find that as you go along, more, as you get older with this, the concept of mentoring networks and people and that relationship becomes much more obvious and easy to deal with for people. Yeah, I just want to add in one more thing about, you know, mentors, you know, wanting to help. And I find, you know, mentors actually get a lot out of mentoring relationships themselves. And a lot of it is new perspectives. Um, you know, sometimes working on a problem for six years, more or less by yourself, you know, not referencing anything in particular, um, you can get sort of like frustrated, find yourself in a rut, um, or, you know, just be like, ah, I wish this was over. But then when you bring in like mentees um, or people and talk about your work, even if they're not your research mentees, just telling them about it and like seeing their eyes light up and think how cool it is can really bring a new light to you and um, push you in new directions that you wouldn't think about. And so definitely, you know, don't be afraid to reach out to mentors thinking that you're going to waste their time or something because most of the time they get something out of the relationship as well. And, um, you know, additionally, network building is, is positive for everyone. Thank you. I think those are great points, especially about finding your allies and, you know, reminding people how you can help them. It's not just about them helping you. Um, so this was great. This was really um, interesting. And I'm going to use that term inventorship as much as I can now.
<laughs> um, does anyone else have any questions for our guests? Um, this is Becky. I was just wondering if Nicole has any knowledge of mentorship software or you were just going to go looking. Yeah, so we um, actually scoped out three different companies um, and the one that we ended up feeling was the best fit for our program is a company called Cronus. Um, I believe it's mm -hmm. C-H-R-O-N-U-S. Um, but there are, are others. Um, a lot of universities actually utilize these for their in their Office of Career Services and things of that nature. Um, but it's, it's nice because you can, you know, create a profile and click different things, topics that you might want to talk about, and then it'll automatically suggest mentors. And then a lot of times you can pick the mentors themselves, um, even have video chats via the software, have chats and emails via the software, schedule meetings all through it. And so everything is streamlined. If you feel like you need to be rematched, you can also do it. And so we have our fingers crossed for this uh, grant application we put in to get this software because I think it'll really um, strengthen the program. Um, anyone else have any other questions? Um, I just wanted to mention if you're new to Zoom, if you hover over the three little dots in the chat, it gives you an option to save the chat. So if people couldn't copy other people's LinkedIn things, you can do it really quick before we sign off. Um, and also, um, this session was recorded and we will be sharing the link. Becky will be adding it to the um, web page. And I usually share it out via. Um, you know, social media or LinkedIn as well. And I was just thinking as we were having this session today, I always value this community and, you know, the time that we get to spend together talking about and learning together. And I just feel that like, especially during this time, it's just so nice to have this connection and be, you know, sharing and talking. So thank you everyone for your time and um, definitely reach out if you have any ideas for, topics for next year we have we you know we try to have a different theme every year and we would love any input on topics guests you know ideas for other types of webinars so please reach out and let us let us know and uh take care have a good summer yeah. thanks everyone nice to meet you thank you <clears throat> have a good rest of your day and look forward to a good summer thank you bye Right.